Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part three of the Q&A, so uh, let me get my hat on, and uh, let's get this going. All right, first question. Hi Jason, you once advocated using triples with sets of 10 spaced 30 seconds apart to develop power. Do you still support that? If so, how would I run something like that uh, concurrently with your basic linear periodization program? I'm working with a martial artist who needs to be more powerful. Uh, all right, brother, that's actually called dynamic effort work or speed work. Um, you can't run my linear periodization program with that. You've got to run a different program. Now, uh, if that's what you wanted to do, you could take one of the days every week and you could change it over to that, meaning you could do speed work uh, with 50 or 60 percent, even 70 percent of your maxes on different days in each workout, but basically you'll have to take days out that are part of the normal linear periodization. When you do this, you are no longer doing linear periodization per se, you're doing concurrent periodization, but you are actually having uh, primary either hypertrophy and strength days that are running a linear periodization pattern, but you're going to have other days every week to where you're doing dynamic effort. Now what I'm going to recommend uh, is that you're going to have to make changes possibly on some of those blocks. I mean, you could run it straight through all the way through on those days for a full 12 week uh, program. Um, just be aware that you might not gain the maximum strength that you want off of the other days. Um, it's an interesting idea. You could try to actually take one of my linear programs and do some concurrent style training with it with the speed work. I mean, you can give it a try. I think it'll probably work. Uh, but you are basically going to have to take uh, days on the back half of the week to do the speed work and just swap that out while making sure that you're doing the linear progression in the blocks uh, the way they're supposed to go for half of the week and the other half of the week. Obviously, you'll have to <laughs> do it the other way. Um, and like I said, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of you're almost doing a concurrent style west side method, but using block periodization instead of max effort work. Um, yeah, I would say it honestly would probably work. Now that I've asked the question, I'm looking at it and think about it, I think it will actually work for what you're looking for uh, because you're going to get the general buildup for this martial artist, but you're also going to give him that speed strength he wants. Um, just be very, very aware of that you're already running a pretty intense block periodization for the, the primary days, that when you do those speed days, make sure he doesn't go too heavy. Um, I might say that, again, uh, maybe 60% of your max 60% of his maxes needs to be the most that you do on those speed days just because of the concurrent nature of it. Uh, that way he won't overtrain as easily and then he can focus purely on speed and power on those days. So if I was going to run it for a martial artist uh, the back half of the week to swap it out for that, work with 60%, maybe even start as low as 50% and work up over the 12-week block. That might be worth doing actually. Start at 50% and over the course of the 12 weeks work up to 60% for the speed work, especially with 10 sets of three. But yeah, give it a try, report back, let me know how it goes. All right, next question. Uh, if I want to run your novice program doing close grip bench press with a pause at the bottom instead of wide grip touch and go and squats with a pause at the bottom instead of using the stretch reflex, uh, what number should I hit before moving to an intermediate program? Thanks. Love your channel. Uh, I'm actually okay with that. Running my novice program with all pause work, uh, I actually kind of hope a lot of people do that anyways. Um, if you're going to take out any touch and go work, removing the stretch reflex and do everything pause, particularly close grip pause, all right, that adds a different component when you're doing it all close grip with pause work instead of just pause bench. And you're doing pause squats, losing the stretch reflex. Uh, reduce the numbers by 5%. So instead of hitting three, 315 pounds on the squats, 300 pounds. If you can hit 295 for five sets of five, pause. Uh, don't even worry about going to 315. 295, you'll be perfectly fine to go on to uh, one, even my intermediate program. Uh, it might, you might even be able to go slightly lower if it's beltless. On the bench press, same thing. Take 5% off, so 10 to 15 pounds. Again, I would say if you can pause, close grip. 205, 205, for five sets of five, uh, you're totally ready to go into an intermediate program. Uh, more than more than strong enough, because again, we're talking about harder variations of these lifts, and you're probably going to be a lot more explosive and overall strong anyways doing it that way. So yeah, brother, that's what I would recommend for that. All right, next question. 
Many lifters wear knee sleeves with the belief that they keep them warm and safe. Does external insulation actually increase synovial joint temperatures or would simply uh, active movement be sufficient to warm up your whole body? All right, guys, these guys who are talking about the knee sleeves keeping them warm in their joints, um, yeah, it's complete horseshit. It's complete bullshit. You're not going to see a single one degree temperature increase in your joints and joint fluid from these sleeves. Moving does that. Actually, lifting weights does that. The actual exercises will do that more than these wraps could ever hope to. Do you know why these people feel like it's keeping their joints warm? I want people to think about that. Do you have temperature sensors inside your joints? That's what people don't understand. They honestly think that they can feel everything inside their body. You do not have temperature sensors in your joints. So if they're feeling warm, where are they feeling the warmth in their joints? The only place around near their joints that has temperature sensors, you know where that is? It's in your skin. Their skin feels warmer on the outside because they're sweating and producing heat that's hitting an object that is warming up next to their skin and getting all sweaty and hot. Therefore, they think that their joints are getting warmer from it. But you know what? Their joints aren't. Those wraps and sleeves will do absolutely nothing to change the temperature inside the joint. The actual act of exercising keeps the joint warm. Your body temperature keeps the joint warm. Again, this is this is a sort of nonsense people come up with and they really think that this is going to help them prevent injury. No, it's not preventing injuries. It's just making your skin feel warm. Um, now, there could be a placebo effect there. They feel more confident that they're not going to get injured so people might feel the ability to push harder. But when you think about it, you think about the, the heat exchange involved and how far in the joint is even further in with insulation, a little fat tissue and everything around it. You're not raising the temperature in the joint with a sleeve. It's impossible that the temperatures the human body produces, our temperature range and the way those sleeves work, they're not doing anything to increase the temperature in the joint. It's just a little warmer against the skin. The joint is staying warm because of your internal body temperature and the fact that you're actually using it, you're moving it, you're exercising. That's where all the warmth is coming from. You could have it completely exposed. Um, to cool air outside and it's not going to make one difference internally versus those sleeves. Uh, complete nonsense. Complete nonsense to help sell products and sell bullshit. Um, and it's, it's again, people have these ideas that because they feel something that that must mean something more than it actually means. All that means when they feel that heat in that area is their skin detecting the outside temperature. It has nothing to do with what's going on inside the joint. Um, but you know what? People want to buy shit. They want to be conned. That's that's their business. That's their right. But let's just call it for what it is. It's bullshit. Sleeves don't actually warm the joints. Uh, no reason to think they actually do. All right, next question. My calves seem to take a beating from squats deadlifts, particularly right by the knee, to the point where I need to roll them on a softball for a bit to get rid of pain in the knee region. Uh, this has been manageable. A manageable annoyance, but there is there anything I can do to prevent or mediate it? All right, brother, here's what you're learning now. The gastrocnemius, the bigger part of the calf, for many people is strongly stimulated on squats and deadlifts, particularly deadlifts. Uh, so a couple different things you can do here. Now that you realize that they are being contracted, uh, they're being worked. What I would say, a few things you can do. Obviously, if they're cramping and causing you problems, uh, definitely doing some myofascial release, uh, whether it's with a foam roller or a softball can help, which you're learning, it pulls it apart. But the other thing that you need to think about is uh, what else are you doing that's causing it to uh, go beyond its maximum recoverable volume? If they're cramping up for you on these exercises, if you're doing separate calf work, it might be time to end that. All right. You're clearly getting excessive stimulation of that region of your calf. You're clearly getting excessive stimulation of the gastrocnemius muscle if it's hurting and cramping after you're performing these big heavy movements. Uh, you either need to scale back the amount of calf work you're doing every week or cut it out completely because you're exceeding your maximum recoverable volume. Now, it could also be the fact that it could be the amount of cardio you're doing or other or general physical preparedness you're doing with these that are pushing it beyond it, in which case you don't necessarily want to cut out your big lifts and you don't want to cut out your cardio. Uh, what you're going to want to do in that case is do two things. Do extra stretching work, extra stretching work for your calves, and then maybe make sure you're getting enough potassium and stuff in your diet. Make sure you're getting enough hydration. It could be a sign that you're not getting enough overall water. It could be a sign you're not getting enough potassium. Maybe you need to add a few more vegetables and stuff to your diet. 
uh, and make sure you're getting hydrated. So more water and then stretching your calves. That's going to help you with this hopefully over time. Stretch your calves every day against a door frame uh, and that will help with the hydration with that over time. But if they're hurting and you're doing calf work, you're actually directly training the calves, it might be time for you to back down on that because you're actually getting sufficient stimulation uh, from your big compound so you can get away with backing that calf work down. Um, and they're probably going to grow from it if you're getting cramps as a result of doing this. You're one of those people who's going to be able to build big calves off the deadlift alone. Uh, fortunately, Omar Isoff isn't one of those, which kind of sucks for him. But uh, you're in a different boat than he is, so just roll with it. Enjoy it. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part four.